So, um, wow, so many years ago, 30 years ago or so, more than that, my first professional job was at Ogilvy & Mather Public Relations. Anybody ever hear of Ogilvy & Mather? Yeah. I was in Chicago in the, the big offices and the high rise. And uh, my soul wanted to be otherwise. <laughs> so after about two years there, I took a leave of absence and went and visited my friend Lara, who was finishing a Peace Corps uh, tour in Africa. And I took six and a half weeks off, sold my car so that I had money to go. <laughs> and. Uh, <coughs> When I returned, um, of course, like we always do, I returned very different, like every day, right? <laughs> every day of this living, we return different. And I came into the CEO's office, Mary Lou, she and I were very different. And um, she had this huge corner office and big glass desk. And I was sitting like a mile away where the guest chair was. It was, you know, just... And she says to me, you know, she didn't really like the idea I was going anyway. She, I think she thought that was very frivolous. And she says to me, leisure becomes you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, wow. I just, you know, here I am in this business suit and I'm somewhere else. Suddenly I'm in Africa again, you know? In this moment when I got out of the, we were on kind of a self-made uh, safari and there was this gazelle and I got out with my camera and then I just stopped and didn't take the picture because I suddenly was in like w within a fairly close distance of a wild animal, you know? And it was, it was a gazelle. I think of it as like a deer, right? But I don't know what a gazelle does. Will it charge me? Will it, you know? So there was like this wonder and this awe and this fear all at once, you know? And it's just me, it seems, and the gazelle and nothing else but the wide plains, you know? And quiet. And then now I think, you know, well, what was the gazelle thinking, you know? <laughs> Was she having a moment of wonder and awe and beholding the beauty of the human before her? Or was she thinking, holy cow, I don't know what that thing is in her hand. What is she going to do? Was she afraid, you know? And it's like that body to body sacredness on earth, those moments of creature to creature meetings, you know? Those, those bring us deep into our souls. And I'd been on this journey of like dust and plains and earthiness and wild animals and vast s skies of stars and you know just like poof, opened up right and then here I'm sitting back in this place a mile away from this woman who's saying leisure becomes you <laughs> and, and it's like she has no context right I get it she has absolutely no context for what she's seeing she's not seeing somebody who's relaxed because they just came back from vacation She's seeing somebody whose soul has been blown open, you know, who's alive, who has touched the aliveness of the earth, who's gone back to the roots of humanity, our birthplace of Africa, and felt the heartbeat, you know, the drumbeat of the heart. It's like a whole different world when we come alive like that. And it just didn't fit anymore. <laughs> and it wasn't long before I left and realized that it didn't fit me anymore, that these business suits were not for me, and this place was not for me. And so it is for us when we come alive like that, we're, we're coming into the body of earth, the body of self and the body of earth that are really one, you know? And that, that's, that's where our soul then and our heart opens up and our, and our authenticity begins to show. And we realize how many ways we separate ourselves from that and cover ourselves up and sort of go along with what we're taught we're supposed to do. And yet, you know, we walk barefoot at, at the ocean and something comes alive in us again. We put our hands in the dirt and begin to dig and, and garden and something in us comes alive again. Something stirs again in the soul, you know, because it's sacred body, sacred body of earth and sacred body of us coming into contact and remembering who we are again. So, no, Mary Lou, it's not leisure that becomes me. <laughs> it's, it's a soul coming alive right in front of you that is happening here. So, you know, Walt Whitman said, I sing the body electric. 
That was his poem and the first line of the poem by the same title. And I was Googling it yesterday and I, I saw that all these people were talking about what did he mean by I sing the body electric. And um, I'm just realizing you're all still in the dark. Are you good with that or do you want some light? Okay. Okay. Well, if you want light, just raise your hand and I'm sure somebody will turn the lights back on. <laughs> so... Um, so he says, I sing the body electric, and people are trying to understand from an intellectual standpoint what I sing the body electric means. And it's like, I don't know what it means exactly, but can't you feel it in a way? It's like when, when you hear that line of poetry, I sing the body electric, it's that sense of aliveness, that sense of the rising of aliveness, a sense of, 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 of waking up again and recognizing the sacredness and the honor of life, the passion in life, all of it. All of it is good. So, you know, we're celebrating both Earth Day on the same day that we're wrapping our series, Resurrecting the Cosmic Christ. And it might on first blush seem like those things are quite different, but actually that they're quite much the same. They're very much infused with one another. As we've been on this series, you know, we've had these stops along the way. The first week was more out into the cosmos, right, from which we came, made of stardust, into the galaxies, and all the way back, deep into the human body to see how the little protons and neutrons move around, and they actually look like a starry sky, and how we are made of that. We come from that cosmos. And this idea of the Christ that we get, and we talk about a lot, is this innate spirit, yet it is something, and something that was definitely emulated for us by Jesus, but it didn't begin, it didn't usher into the world at Jesus' time, but the Christ was something that's always been. This cosmic Christ idea is like the great I am, right? From the beginning of time, the, the source and more. It's, it's the mystery. So it's bringing that mystery back in, and, that, and then that innate essence of the Christ, that spirit that the body temple houses. It's all of that. So in that first time we were, that first week we were looking at that, and then the second week we quickly grounded it, especially after I heard from one or two people that said, whoa, I didn't really even know where we were in that cosmic, <laughs> you know, kind of opening it all up into the heavens. And so we grounded it with, here I am. You know, here I am, the, the, the Moses story before the burning bush. Here I am, just offering myself over as service to the earth, to be the invisible God on earth through the visible body, mm -hmm. to be able to be able to, sh to share and to serve and to be in that sacredness. And the next week we looked at the transfiguration, the altering appearance, the radiance of the divine light that shines through us and as us. And, and looked at the, the experience of the transfiguration as, as Jesus experienced it, and how that alteration happens for all of us when we come into that kind of translucence through the body of the light showing through. And then, of course, last week we were at the resurrection, the resurrection, right? Easter Sunday. And we talked about how Jesus is the is the, the mystic that showed us a very kind of unusual form of mysticism in a way, because for so long we've always seen it as transcendence, and yet he was all about embodiment of spirituality. And that's actually what the resurrection was. He came back into his body, and he walked and talked among his friends, and he ate food to show us this, this embodied spirituality that we are. So the resurrecting of the cosmic Christ is very earthy, actually. It's very much an earthy thing. And it's, we're back now to the sacred earth and the sacred body, and they are one. It's so often we think, you know, when we hear, we hear so much about the earth today, right? With climate change and all that, that looms over our heads. But, you know, if you talk to many Native American people, say, the earth is fine. She's going to be fine. Because the earth knows how to, how to resurrect herself. She knows how to regenerate herself. The question is, do we? <laughs> right? The question is, do we know how to honor the sacred body of self and therefore the sacred body of earth and vice versa? And that's the key. That's the linchpin. That's the, the question that the jury's still out on. <laughs> But more and more of us are waking up, right? More and more of us are realizing that this wholeness, this allness, this embodied spirituality is absolutely key to our understanding. 
And so we're walking that walk together. You know, our bodies even look like the earth, if you think about it. We have mountains and valleys and vast plains and waters. We have <laughs> blue v rivers that run through us like as, as in veins. And, and our bodies smell like the earth. You know, sometimes they smell dusty or like the ocean or the rain or even the flowers. You know, so we have that kind of... Look, we look and we smell and you know it, we have the sensuousness that is very much like the earth itself and we also are that our vitality comes from the elements just like the earth you know just like wind and fire and earth and water we too are that in the body right so the earth itself like the body but the emotions very much like water right that move through us that emote and move through us and wave through us and then also thoughts like air, right? The thoughts, the importance of the thoughts and the, and the very breath of spirit that moves through us very much like air. But also spirit is the fire. It's the light that ignites in us. It is the, the, the way and the passion that moves through us to share in the world. So there's so many ways. We're just beginning to scratch the surface of the ways that the body of earth and the body of us is one and the same. And so when we care for the body of earth, when we open to that, it's a whole different world. When we commune with, with this body of earth, when's the last time you ate? Anybody eat today? And did you consume or did you commune? Because <laughs> it's a real different vibration, isn't it? You know, we had a communion service recently during Easter week. And during that communion service, of course, we broke bread. And the bread, the substance, the body of Christ, the body of the earth, the, the daily prayer, the abundance, it had so many ways of speaking to us. And last night, the last night of Passover, many people celebrated in synagogues and homes the Seder, the experience of Seder. And you know, one of those celebrations was marked by tragedy in San Diego. Some of you may have heard of a shooting in a synagogue. And it just breaks the heart open, doesn't it, when we are in these sacred places of ritual and we are in the most sacred places of, of infusing spirit in the essence of who we are and recognizing how honorable life is. And then there are those who are so separate from it so cut off from it, you know? And so it's, it's for us to take those rituals even deeper. It's for us to really take up those rituals and to understand that every time we eat, it is Seder. Every time we eat, it is Passover. That marking of freedom and peace. And every time we break the bread or drink the wine or have the grapes or the honey or anything that we might eat, even fast food, <laughs> can be slowed down. There's a whole slow food mu movement. I don't know if you know about that, but <laughs> with a blessing, right, of where this food came from, the animals and the plants that, that produced this food, the farmers that, that grew it, that dug in the earth, and that, you know, the, the sun that raised it up, and the rains that fell down, all of that is in that. And so it, three times a day, and probably more, if you're like me, probably more like six times a day, you have something to eat. <laughs> and when you do, there's an opportunity to slow that down and to recognize you're having a fruit of the earth, the body of Christ, right there. And it's coming into your body. And it's sacred. And your body is sacred. So often we are mean to our bodies, right? We're cruel and critical with our bodies. And yet when we do that, we are criticizing the very spirit that we love because it can't be separated. And, we're, and, and so it is the way that we treat the body then that becomes the way that we treat the earth. And the more that we bring this sacredness, this kind of sacred communion to our times of eating, our times of drinking, the things that we do all the time, 
then it gets woven into our lives like that and everything mundane becomes sacred. Everything becomes holy to us. We see then through the holy eyes, we feel through the holy heart. We just, we have that sense. And when we have that sense, then there is a whole different kind of relationship that opens up with the natural world and the home upon which we live. And it just automatically, we take better care because we are taking better care of this that is spirit. Lots of lots of little energies that come together to make us from the stardusty essence of the cosmos to the dust of the earth. It's all us. That's what Jesus meant when he said, both you are the light of the world and you are the salt of the earth. We're both and both are sacred. So I was talking about the um, uh, Seder, and it reminded me, too, of Sabbath. Um, I have a friend, Mirabai Starr, who some of you may know. She's an author. She's actually coming here in August. Very excited to have her come. Um, but she and I were doing a, um, leading a, a retreat in Spain a few years ago in Avila, Spain, where Teresa of Avila hails from. And wherever Mirabai travels, she likes to bring the ritual of Sabbath to enjoy with other people. So on Friday evening, very much like communion, there is a, a ritual to kick off Sabbath. And so we were all gathered around her and having this Sabbath together. And she had us, there's a photo of us that I wanna show you. She had us cover our eyes. And why she had us cover our eyes was because the holy bread was there. And, she, and the bread was covered with this beautiful cloth. And she referred to the bread as she. And she said, you must close your eyes and cover your eyes because we're about to unveil her. And so we were all instructed to once the, the veil came off the bread, we were to take our hands off our eyes and see the beauty. And together, just we all went, oh! And then we broke the bread. You know, it's like those simple but beautiful rituals that open us to the sacred, that remind us of the sacred that we are. Mary Oliver finds God in a slice of melon in this verse from her book, Thirst. Every morning, she says, I want to kneel down on the golden cloth of sand and say some kind of musical thanks for the world that is happening again another day. From the shawl of the wind coming out of the west to the firm green flesh of the melon lately sliced open and eaten, its chill and ample body, flavored with mercy. I want to be worthy of what? Glory. Yes, unimaginable glory. O oh Lord of melons, of mercy, I am climbing toward you. <clears throat> That's how, that's how I end every Mary Oliver poem. Mm. <laughs> so I was doing some training years ago on mirroring. If any of you have done a nature immersion with me or any of my nature work, I, this is part of it, that at the end of your solo time in nature, we come back and tell stories, and I mirror your story back to you. And while we were being trained in this, we went through the different phases, the different seasons, essentially, like the body goes through the different seasons, right? So summer is the child, it's play, it's discovering the body and exploring in this particular wheel of life. And in the, in the West, in the uh, fall time, the season of fall, we are more in the internal, more in the emotional, more in the kind of introspective kind of place and and then we come from there into the winter the time of of the adult and in in winter time we're nurturing our family and we're serving but we also at the end of that winter time we make our transition right we go into spring and it's rebirth and renewal and we are born again and but it's also the spirit time of spirit igniting the spirit through that that mysterious time and so this particular day, we were, it was the first day where we were um, in, having an experience of the child of the summertime, the season of the body that is summer. And, um, and something happened where, you know, which, you know, it's, it's great when this does happen that you completely shift into the experience. And so I did, I completely shifted into the experience and it, 
now I can see it from a different angle, but then I was a child again, you know, I went into the child again and, and into the exploration of the body and jumped in this, you know, really cold stream of water and then found my way up this small hill or mountain, I guess, a small mountain, I would say. And, and there were rocks there. And to me, it just looked like a horse inviting me to ride it. And so I rode the horse, you know, I don't know for how long I was just playing. I was just a child again. But there was a sense of at some point it was time to come home and I, so I went back down the hill and I wouldn't have ever seen this like just before that, just before shifting into the eyes of a child. Like Jesus talks, the child will, you know, lead us, in, will lead us, you know, that's the way into the kingdom, right? And so I had been, I was in though that kind of frame of mind when I walked down and I looked at these rocks that just before that would have looked through my adult eyes like rocks, but I sucked my breath in and I went, oh! the rock people. <laughs> and they really did. They were like breathing formations of rock people. I mean, they were alive. And there's that, that when we come into this kind of sacred understanding of who we are and what nature is in this body of earth, everything then comes alive for us. Everything becomes honorable. And we, we snap out of our superiority complex, you know, which is a big part of our problem, is this illusion that we are superior to other living things. And this idea that we, because we have a human brain and we think the animal or the being or the, even the rock has, has none or has a limited one, we create this kind of superiority kind of way of thinking. But if we can instead open up to the divine intelligence that we all share, a whole new realm of communication can open up for us. J. Allen um, Boone talks about this in a book from 1954, published in 1954, called Kinship with All Life. Anybody heard of this book? I know there was a heart math group that studied this book, I learned this morning from Holly. And somebody handed me the book, if it was one of you, thank you very much, about a year ago. And I just picked it up a couple of days ago. And uh, I loved it, and I want to share with you a little bit of what uh, Jay Allen talked about. So he was caring for Strongheart, who was a movie star, apparently, in those times. Anybody ever hear of Strongheart the dog, the German Shepherd movie star? Some of you are nodding, sort of vaguely remember. So apparently Strongheart was this big, beautiful German shepherd. He was police trained, he was military trained, and then he became a movie star on top of it all. And Jay Allen was just taking care of him. So he didn't really know much about him from the movie angle. He was just asked when the parents went on vacation to, to be the, the caregiver. And so he spent time with this magnificent dog. This dog would do things like he wanted to play, and so he would go and open the door, the closet where his toys were kept with his jaw, and he'd look around and pick the toy he wanted, and then he'd go out and he'd throw it around and play in the yard by himself for a while. This is what's amazing. When he was done, he would go and put it back in the closet and shut the door. <laughs> if only our, our children were so well trained, right? <laughs> And Jay Allen was experimenting with all these things about starting to see the dog not as human and dog, but as intelligent equals. Open both of us to the divine mind. So why wouldn't divine intelligence come through both of us? And the dog tended to be more in the present moment and more open, right? So all the more the divine intelligence would just move through this dog, which it did, and all dogs and all animals for that matter. I'll get to another one in a moment that Jay Allen talked about. So, so with Stronghold, there's one other story I just want to tell you that he, he started to recognize that it wasn't just when he spoke to Strongheart that there was these connections, but it was also when he thought things. And so one day he was working, and it was a beautiful spring day, and he'd been working for several hours, hadn't seen the dog in quite a while, and he just thought to himself, oh, it'd be nice if we went out and took a romp in the countryside. And no sooner had he thought it than Stronghold came, strong, strong heart came skidding into the room, doing circles and up and down and super excited. And then he ran into the bedroom and got Jay Allen's sweater that he always took on their outings and brought it and dropped it at his feet. There's more. Went and got his hiking pants, did the same. 
went and got one hiking shoe, brought it back, went and got the other hiking shoe, and finally the walking pole. And then continued to dance and prance and, you know. And so it was nothing to the dog that he could read his, his mind. But of course, it was everything to the human who's like, holy cow, I didn't know, you know. And he talked about how, you know, yeah, this dog seemed special in some ways, but all animals could do this. And he began to have this communion with everything, ants and worms and a fly. Yes, even a fly. I know most of us consider flies dirty and annoying, but Jay Allen found an equality with a fly. So one day he was shaving and there was a fly on the mirror. He went into the kitchen after he finished shaving and the fly followed him in. He went into the living room and the fly followed him in and the fly stayed with him throughout his day as he was working. And he made an agreement with the fly. He said, look, humans don't like it when flies crawl on their exposed skin. He said, so you, you can do anything, but you cannot crawl on my skin. You can crawl on my clothes, but you can't crawl on my, he said the fly never crawled on his skin again. And this fly, he said, when he wanted to get his attention, he called, called him Freddy. So <laughs> Freddy the fly would come right in front of his nose and do all these acrobatics when he wanted to get his attention. So he started doing things like putting his finger up and the fly would land on his finger. And then he started a game where he would throw Freddy up in the air and he had drawn a line on his palm and one side was for Jay Allen and one side was for Freddy. And the game was to see which side Freddy would fall on. And he said, Freddy always landed more on the Freddy side, and so he always won the game. He said, in fact, I owed him thousands of dollars by the time the thing was over. <laughs> so in the few weeks that a fly lives, Freddy was his friend, not his pet, but his friend, his intelligent equal, that he was able to call this fly when he wanted to, and the fly would abide by certain things that he asked the fly to do, and they were like friends. And if he could become friends like that with a fly and open to the divine intelligence, how much are we missing? You know? How much are we missing when we just squish things, <laughs> take the life out of it? Why do, why do we do that even? And so there's, a, there's a, that kind of sacredness that maybe next time we'll think about catching the little critter and freeing it instead, because we always have an option. We always have a choice, right? And the sacredness of all of life, this is part of how we honor the body of Earth, is to honor all of her creatures and to see that there is a divine intelligence that moves through all beings, that makes all beings a part of this Earth. And our sharing with them, whether it is a deer that we're beholding, or a flower that we're smelling, or earth that's between our fingers, or sand that's between our toes, whatever it is that we are experiencing in that moment, it is just that present moment of this, of this, of this, kind of that melting into this, that allows us then to care for the sacredness of the body, and automatically then, we care for the sacredness of all beings and of our Mother Earth home. It just happens because we're in that kind of consciousness. So invitation after invitation is awaiting us. When I ended my trip in Kenya, our friend George, he was a, a guide and Laura and I taught, he taught us a song in Swahili that we all sang and then we taught him an American iconic song, the American Pie. And, uh, <laughs> We all sang that. And then I said, you know, this trip would be perfect if I could see a shooting star. I've never seen a shooting star in my life. And it wasn't too long after that a star went streaking through the sky, you know. And it's that reminder again, back to the stardust, right? Back to the cosmos, back to the, the Christ that is everywhere present. When we eat, when we drink, when we walk, when we talk, when we serve, when we sit, when we rest, everywhere sacred. We are that. We are the resurrected cosmic Christ when we move with that kind of consciousness, that kind of softness, that kind of lightness, soft focus in the world. 
Let's know this together as we close this series that we have indeed resurrected the cosmic Christ and we've done it in this way through the body and as the body and the sacredness of all of it. Let's say it together, our affirmations. I am the embodied cosmic Christ. I am the body of sacred earth. And so it is. Thank you.